people are coming in, just going to wait two or three minutes. Is your computer charged? Mine is charging. And so this is kind of a chocolate cable. Is everybody listening? We'll continue to wait a few more minutes as we allow our um, audience guests to arrive. Ellen, I think we're a go. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to part one of a three part mini series as we look at community, protecting, sustaining, and growing. Thank you for joining us. Beit Hamidrash Synagogue, in partnership with Sharad Setik Synagogue and the Jewish Federation of Greater Vancouver is hosting this evening's virtual community gathering whose purpose is to look at creating safe spaces. Spaces that are abuse-free while also examining this topic through the lens of Jewish values. What does Torah say about creating safe spaces in our community? Never has there been a time when looking after each other or taking care of each other has resonated as deeply as it does right now in our lives, as we grapple with the challenges, the measures, and the constant change of a pandemic. Protecting, sustaining, and growing community, no doubt, takes on a totally different hue in that context. Kol Yisrael arivim zelezeh. Protecting communities sometimes necessitates looking at items, engaging in difficult conversations that take us out of our comfort zone. In order to create a community that thrives and flourishes, we need to also sometimes look at ensuring that we have safe boundaries and measures in place to protect our children. Allow me to share with you the structure of tonight's program, which is divided into three components. We will first open with our keynote speaker, Rachel Bayer, who will shortly be introduced by Rabbi Shlomo Gabai. The second component, and immediately following the keynote address, will be a short community panel comprised of Ms. Shelley Rifkin, Rabbi Andrew Rosenblatt, and Rabbi Shlomo Gabai. The third and last component following the community panel will be a question and answer period. Please feel free to put your questions, should you have any, into the chat. They can be sent to everyone in the chat or privately to me. Rabbi Gabai.
Thank you for joining everyone. This is truly a remarkable evening. Um, something so important, not often discussed. And we as a community have decided to take the initiative to be a bit of ahead of the curve and to address this difficult topic in order to maintain and protect and keep safe our beautiful community. Just want to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening. Rachel Bayar is a CEO and a former sex crime and child abuse prosecutor who has worked in the field of sexual misconduct and abuse prevention for over a decade. She built her career on creating safe spaces and facilitating facilitating change in workplaces globally. Rachel recently served as a managing director in the sexual misconduct consulting and investigation division of a global security and consulting firm. Previously, she spent many years as an assistant district attorney in both the Child Abuse, Sex Crime and Domestic Violence Bureau at the Bronx District Attorney's Office. Rachel, Bayar is also the curriculum in teaching and abuse prevention in specific faith-based communities and has been featured in webinars for camps, schools, and parents on pre preventing sexual abuse of children. She serves in multiple faith-based child protection committees on the advisory council of Ta'amod, Transforming Jewish Workplaces, has co-authored articles on sexual abuse and was recognized by the Jewish Week 36 under 36 in 2017 for activism and efforts towards preventing sexual misconduct and abuse, particularly against children. Rachel is a peer better Kappa graduate of Rogers University and received a Juris Doctorate from Seton Hall University School of Law. Rachel, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It is absolutely a pleasure to be here with you. And I wanna thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with your community on what it means to really think about creating safe spaces. And before we even jump into what it is that I wanna share, and I wanna thank you for that wonderful introduction, I want you to understand that when we think about the phrase creating safe spaces, that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And when we think about creating safe spaces, what we really need to be able to articulate is which part of creating safe spaces are we speaking about in this moment? We could talk about it from the perspective of how adults interact with each other. We can speak about how children interact with each other as well. We can think about our homes and our synagogues and our places where everybody congregates. But for tonight, what I really wanna do is I wanna take a moment for us to acknowledge and recognize that creating safe spaces requires us to have a fundamental understanding of when safe spaces are not created, what it really means to keep kids safe, what it means to do this from the perspective of being a Jewish community, what it means to create a community in terms of those safe spaces. Everything that I share with you today and the work that I do across North America and really the world is because of the work that I did as a sex crimes and child abuse prosecutor, as well as a managing director of a sexual misconduct division, where I conducted investigations, forensic interviews and prosecutions for many, many years. And as the CEO of the Bayer Group, I travel around both on Zoom as well as in person and work with schools and camps and houses of worship and youth organizations and sports teams on what it really means to create a safe space. And the truth is that when we talk about child protection in general, one of the things that we all have to be able to do is kind of shift our perspective and the lens that we might come to this conversation with. Because so many times, and I say this both as a professional as well as a parent, so many times we come at this from the perspective of let's learn. Let's learn what sexual abuse is. Let's learn what we need to do to keep other kids safe. 
But so many times when we're talking about this, it becomes very difficult for our perspective to actually be that this could happen to our kids. This could happen in our synagogue. This could happen in our school. And so when we really think about creating safe spaces, I want every single person here to kind of take a collective deep breath and really think about shifting the perspective that we have, that yes, it can happen to our kids. It can happen in our communities. And so what that means is that when we think about creating safe spaces, we can't actually minimize any of the risk until we face the risk head on. And what that means is that abuse prevention and understanding sexual abuse and what we're going to talk about in just a few moments requires all of us to not only think about the conversation that we have with our kids, with our grandchildren, with the kids in our spaces, but also the conversations that we have with each other. Because at its core, and I do this all the time when I speak to children and I speak to their parents and I walk into a place, at its core, we can give as many tools for a child safety toolkit as we can, but we are actually the protectors. It is not a child's responsibility to keep them safe from sexual abuse. It is actually ours, and not just as people, but also as Jews. And that's why this conversation actually requires us to have an understanding of the bad stuff that can happen, of understanding the stuff that we rarely talk about because it is so difficult to do that. And there are statistics that get floated around all over the place. And one of those statistics is that one in four girls or one in 13 boys, or one in four children who identify as female, or one in 13 children who identify as male, and sometimes these numbers shift, will be sexually abused by the time they turn 18. And I think that the initial reaction in hearing that is, oh my goodness, what that means is that children that we come in contact with, children that we know that are in our families, they could have been, they may be, and at some point they may be in the future sexually abused. And so what that requires from us is a deep understanding of what we can do to cultivate safe spaces and ensure that it's not happening in our communities, in our schools, in our synagogues, and to the children that we know. The reason why we have to think about these numbers is because it becomes integral to understanding that when it comes to understanding the type of people that might sexually abuse a child, all of our preconceived notions, all of the things that we see on an episode of Law & Order SVU or a TV show or a movie, I want you to remove them from your mind. I want you to get rid of all of the myths in terms of who we think might actually sexually abuse a child because guaranteed it doesn't end up being the person that you assume looks creepy or looks scary. Because at its core, there are many different type of people that could sexually abuse a child. And one type of personality could be the personality that we read about the most. The one that we see in terms of the abuser that is dynamic and keeps everyone's attention, that when they speak, people listen and they really pay attention. Maybe that person is so dynamic because they appear to do so much good. They're an amazing author who reaches children or they're an amazing person, and I say that in quotes, who seems to really help families that are struggling or teenagers or kids that are struggling that have appeared to do so much good, that have used their dynamic personality as a way to be able to appear to do so much good. When you have someone that sexually abuses a child that is that type of personality, what that person knows is that the time that they spend alone with a child, people are probably not going to question. What that abuser knows is that there's a good chance that if that child or that teenager comes forward and says something to someone, that they're probably not going to be believed. Because who would believe a child or a teenager over someone that has appeared to do so much good? But the problem with understanding that type of personality is that there is no such thing as a typical sexual abuser. Sexual abuse is the great 
equalizer that we do not speak about. It can happen to anyone. And the truth is that when it comes to understanding people who sexually abuse a child, it's important to understand that it spans every gender, religion, race, socioeconomic level. There's no such thing as saying there's no way that that person could have done it because look at the amazing things that they've done or there's no way that that person could have done it because of who they appear to be. They're so wealthy or they are female or they are someone that just is so mild mannered. We would never have expected this. The truth is that so many sexual abusers are really good at being able to fly under the radar. And 91% of kids who are sexually abused are abused by someone that they or their family knows. When we think about people who might sexually abuse a child, so many times we think about that scary stranger, right? The person that seems super creepy that you might cross the street to get away from. We all kind of envision that initial scene in like a Law & Order episode where a mom is walking down the street, it's a beautiful Sunday morning, and she's holding the hand of a child, and, and they're walking down the street, and you know something really bad is about to happen because it's a Law & Order episode, but you're not sure what. And then all of a sudden, the mom looks across the street and sees this super creepy, scary person who's staring at her child and the music changes and the mom gets so nervous and so worried and she grabs that child and the child gets really upset and her, and the child is like eating an ice cream cone right or a lollipop and all of a sudden that creepy scary person starts to cross the street to get towards the child and the mom is like grabbing the child and the ice cream falls and everybody's crying and so upset and then it turns out that the mom trips over a crime scene because the episode has nothing to do with that scary, creepy person. That person that you might say to yourself, ooh, they're super creepy, they're super scary, they're giving me like pedophile vibes, which is a phrase that I've heard many times uttered to me in the past. For the most part, in the majority of cases, that's not the person who's sexually abusing a child. The notion of stranger danger that I know I grew up with, right? Don't get into a car with a stranger, don't take candy from a stranger, and don't pet a stranger's puppy, right? All of that. Now, we literally get into cars with strangers every time we take an Uber or a Lyft. But that notion of stranger danger or that creepiness factor accounts for under 10% of the kids that are being sexually abused. And I want you to take a step back and I want you to think about it logically. In order to sexually abuse a child, it means you have to have access to kids, which means you have to be good with kids, which means you have to fly under the radar because there isn't a person on this Zoom who would ever leave their children or grandchildren or the children in their care with a creepy, scary person which means that in order for us to create safe spaces, we have to have this deep understanding that we may not recognize when it is that someone is dangerous to be around children from our preconceived notions or the myths that exist in the media, which requires us to have an understanding of how sexual abuse works. And for the most part, in the majority of cases, it involves a process called grooming. Grooming is a slow and steady seduction of a child. It is a natural breakdown of the natural boundaries that exist between that adult and that child in whatever situation they're in, in a school, in a family, in a camp, in a synagogue, where all of a sudden that person, that adult, that abuser identifies a vulnerability in that child. And maybe it's an obvious vulnerability, something that might be seen by everybody. And maybe it's something that's actually not obvious at all, right? The one kid who seemed really upset in a summer camp that their parents came late to visiting day, or that one child who gets to get up in synagogue and actually do something as part of their youth group or as part of what's happening that Shabbat. And it turns out that their parent leaves to go to the bathroom in that one moment. And I want you to imagine that when we think about the vulnerability in a child, I don't just want you to think about what's obvious. I want you to think about what we call a vulnerability of a moment in time. 
a moment in time where somebody that's watching that child, that knows that child, that's familiar with that family, sees the parent walk out or sees the parent come late or sees that that child in that moment realizes that maybe they're not the priority. And imagine that abuser who's already known and is not a stranger walking over to that child and saying something like, you were amazing. You were totally awesome. You were so great. You were so amazing. And I got to tell you, I think you were like the best singer. I think you are the kid that is most deserving of having your parent here because you're the best camper. And I know that your parent wasn't paying attention. I know that your grandparent wasn't paying attention, but I just want you to know I was. And I think you're amazing. And I think you're more special than everybody else. And by the way, don't tell anyone this because I don't wanna make anybody else jealous and I don't wanna make your parents feel bad. And you could imagine that in that moment of this person that is known to that child, they turn to that child and not only compliment them, not only bring them close, but they do it in a way where they're saying to that child, hey, there's something so special and so unique about you, but I don't want you to tell anyone that you're more special than anybody else. Don't tell your parents, don't tell anybody else. And I want you to imagine if after that abuser approaches that child, Again, because they're known, a few days later, that child's in a situation where that abuser comes over to them and says, hey, I can't stop thinking about how amazing you were in synagogue, or I can't stop thinking about how amazing you were when you were singing in the choir. And so I was in a store and I noticed something and I bought it because it made me think of you. And I just, it's something so little, it's not a big deal. And all of a sudden you're in a position where that person gifts over something little whether it's candy or treats or a gift or even just their time and attention. They're turning to that child and they're saying, listen, this is special for you. Like, don't tell anybody else. Like, this is not for anyone else. And maybe they say it with a smile and maybe they say it in a way that brings that child in. But that child starts to feel special. And through naturally breaking down all of the boundaries that should exist in that situation, by cultivating a relationship with that child, by engaging in what we consider to be a slow and steady seduction, that child starts to see that person as a really awesome person, as someone that maybe they can rely on or that they can go to when they have problems or someone that really gets them or really understands them. Because sexual abuse in the majority of cases doesn't happen in a violent manner. Sexual abuse in a majority of cases isn't happening with a weapon. It's not happening by holding someone down. It's happening by cultivating a relationship through this grooming process. And so it becomes so important in our understanding, in terms of creating a safe space, in terms of our understanding of the community, is that we can't keep kids safe unless we understand how sexual abuse actually thrives and how it works. And so many times when we hear about someone that may have been arrested or somebody that there is a suspicion about, we have this cognitive dissonance, this inability to believe that the person that we're seeing in front of us is actually a person that could have done this because it doesn't match up with our perception of them being super friendly, of them being really lovely, of them not appearing violent or angry or creepy at all but we do a disservice to our community by believing in myths. And so the reason why I share with you what this grooming process is, is because I get asked all the time, okay, so now that you have sufficiently scared us about the fact that we may not be able to tell, is there anything that you can say, anything that can be said about ways that you can tell, ways that you can cultivate a safe space? And the truth is that I wish that there was an immediate magic serum that I could bottle up and give to you and say to you, you know what, with this magic serum, you would be good to go. But the truth is that in any community, in any space, the magic serum is you. The magic serum is the members of the community who show up for a night like this to learn, to engage, to communicate, 
to really think about this from a Jewish values perspective and also from a human perspective, to be able to understand that we can actually identify things like the red flags of grooming behavior and actually be able to delineate the differences between a healthy relationship with a child and between something that's actually nefarious. And we do this by having our eyes open by understanding that every single one of our institutions needs to be in a position to create a safe space, both, both on a micro level and also on a macro level. So when we think about these red flags of grooming behavior, one of the biggest ones is that no healthy adult needs a child to keep a secret from their parents. Now, the truth is, when we really think about that, distill that down a bit. And I want to share with you a story, something that happened with one of my own children, which, which for those of you, if any of you have heard me speak before, I've probably shared this. It is one of my most favorite stories to share. Um, I have three kids. And when my middle daughter um, was three years old, and this is going back a while, I was uh, spending the summer, I was at the DA's office, the district attorney's office. I was in court um, most of the summer in navigating a rape case. And I didn't have a smartphone. I didn't check my email during the day. And at the end of the day, I get home after a very long day of being yelled at by a judge for most of the day, most of which was absolutely not deserved. Only some of it was probably slightly deserved. And I made a position where I get this email and the email is from her counselor, who's a teacher and it's titled Your Daughter. And there was an ominous ring to the subject of your daughter. And I remember opening up the email and my heart starts to palpitate. I start to get really nervous. And I immediately respond and I ask her, can we please get on a phone? My three-year-old was in this nursery school summer camp. Her teacher was writing me an email. I was so incredibly worried about the email that I had read. So we get on the phone later that evening, and this is what she tells me, that that day in nursery school summer camp, she had taken all of the three-year-olds and she put them in a circle in the middle of the room and she turned to them and she said, hey kids, who here wants to learn a secret way to read music and play instruments? Today is going to be an amazing music lesson. And all of the three-year-olds are like, okay, yeah, sure, that sounds great. Except for my three-year-old. My three-year-old stands up removes herself from the circle, points at her teacher and says, no, you're not allowed to do that. That's what bad people do and my mom puts people like you in jail. And the teacher's like, what? No one's going to jail. And my kid is like, you're going to jail. She's going to jail. Everybody get up, get up, get up. And she starts to incite chaos in her three-year-old nursery school classroom. And the teacher is trying to understand what she is talking about and she hears her yell. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to make me keep a secret from my ima and abba, from my mom and dad. That's what bad people do. And in that moment, her teacher still had no idea why she was totally freaking out, but she understood that it had to do with the word secret. So she turns to my daughter and she says, it's fine. It's fine. You can tell your parents about what we're doing in class. Just sit down. And she still won't sit down. And at the age of three, she turned to her teacher and she said, you know, you're not allowed to do that. And the teacher's like, I got that. And then she turned to her and she said, you know, you used the wrong word. The word you should have used was surprise because a surprise has an ending and a secret doesn't. And we don't keep secrets from our parents. Now, once I learned that she wasn't getting kicked out of nursery school summer camp, which was a little bit my fear as I was navigating this conversation, the truth is it was probably one of my most proud parenting moments. And the reason why is because when we think about what it means to create safe spaces and protect our kids, it is overwhelming to think about the conversations that we have to have. But every red flag of grooming behavior can be distilled down in a way that we can talk to our kids and in a way that we can educate our community in understanding that if every single person, every single adult plays a part in creating safe spaces, we would be able to identify the red flags of grooming behavior and be able to understand the difference. No healthy adult needs a child to keep a secret for them.
Secrets are what people who groom children use to silence them. When you have somebody that's focused only on one or two or three particular kids to the expense of everybody else, when you're in a situation where you know that there is somebody in the community who's not only focused on those one or two or three particular kids, but there's a secretiveness in the way that they're navigating things. When you have someone that blurs the boundaries that are set in your synagogue, in your schools, in your camps, when you have someone that's engaging in grooming behavior, small gifts, special gifts, money, time, treats, and it's meant to kind of be just between them. It's something that cultivates this relationship of sorts. That that should be a red flag to you. When we think about creating safe spaces, you are most probably never going to walk in on a crime being committed, but you are going to see this boundary crossing behavior in a way that makes you say, huh, wait a second. There's something that feels a little bit off about what that is. And most people may say to themselves, well, wait a second. You know, nobody said that there's anything bad. I trust this person. I know this person. This person is, is somebody who seems to have done so much good. And by the way, nobody's ever said anything bad. Nobody's ever disclosed anything bad when it comes to this. Well, the truth is that part of our magic serum Part of the superpower that each and every one of you bring is in not only understanding how sexual abuse works, but in understanding that when that child is being groomed, when that child is in a situation where someone has cultivated that connection, it means that to that child, the entire process is not scary. It means that when you really think about that, when that abuser does something sexual to that child, touches them, or has the child touch the abuser or exposes them slowly and gradually to something sexual, it's probably not going to be violent. And I want you to imagine what it might feel like or the onus that rests on the shoulders of a child, whether they're five years old or 16 years old, when the person that has cultivated this relationship with them, this friendship, this care and compassion, all of a sudden does something horrific to them. And they're standing in that moment and they're thinking to themselves, how could it be? How could it be that the person that cares about me, that the person that loves me, that the person that spent all of this time with me, how could it be that that person would do something so bad to me? Well, maybe it's not bad, or maybe I'm supposed to learn this, or maybe this is something that, that didn't really happen, or maybe, maybe it's my fault. Maybe I caused this, and if I share it with anyone, not only are they not going to believe me, but they're going to believe that it's my fault. Maybe I'm humiliated or embarrassed or ashamed. Maybe my body had a physiological reaction to what it was that happened, and in that moment, I say to myself, well, if my body betrayed me and acted in a particular way, then I, I can't claim that I wasn't a part of it. Maybe nobody's ever turned to that child and said, this is sexual abuse. And if something like this happens, it is not your fault. We can teach our children and arm them with tools for their safety toolkit in terms of understanding that there is behavior that is safe and there is behavior that is unsafe. We can start talking to kids from a very young age about the names, the proper names of their genitals and private parts so that there's no shame attached to them, so that they can identify if something has happened. We can categorize behavior in terms of safe versus unsafe. We can start talking to our kids from the time that they are so little that they don't even understand exactly what we're saying. But all of the conversations in the world go out the window. If what we don't realize is that when a child is faced with abuse in that moment, in those moments with the person that they know and they trust, they are probably going to blame themselves. And so what is our responsibility? Our responsibility is not to put the responsibility on our kids. It is to recognize that as a community, our words and our actions matter both in terms of the conversations that happen around our Shabbat tables, as well as the conversations that happen in our synagogues, as well as the policies and procedures and training that we implement to create safe spaces. 
But when we really think about it, the question that typically gets asked is why didn't someone say something? Why didn't that child tell me? I have a pretty close relationship with my three kids. I hope that if God forbid something happened to one of them, they would come and they would tell me. And I will tell you, we've had enough conversations about abuse prevention that I'm not sure they could have had a single one more. But I know that that's not the way it works. And there's a chance that they may not come to me because if they believe that this is their fault, if their community has never said, we will always support survivors, we will always support victims, we will believe you, then that safe space isn't cultivated. So when we think about the small moments that we create, whether in our own families or our own organizations, I want us to think about the words we use. The fact that when someone is sitting at a Shabbat table and they hear someone say, someone got arrested, or there's a suspicion about someone else, and the reference of, well, they're innocent until proven guilty. We don't know. There are probably two sides to the story. A simple statement like that invalidates any survivor or victim that is sitting around your table. And chances are you are not going to know who those people are because so many people do not disclose. Every single moment of sexual abuse, whether creation of child sexual abuse material, which is what some people, which is what we call, um, what some people refer to as child pornography, whether it's an in-person sexual abuse, whether it's in a family, whether it's in a community, every single one has a victim. Those victims are people in our communities that deserve to be believed and should not have to be in a situation where they have to prove themselves to be heard. And so when we think about the practical application to creating safe spaces, and believe me, if we had four hours, I could probably speak for more than four hours. I want you to think about it from this perspective not just what we do in our homes and the conversations that we have both with our children and the people that care for our children, but look at your communal institutions. What do your schools, what do your camps, what do your houses of worship, your youth organizations, what do they do in terms of child protection? There's no such thing as saying, oh yeah, we totally have a policy. What is that policy? Is that policy about abuse prevention? Does it deal with required reporting? Does it deal with how to do that? Does it deal with boundaries and the necessary boundaries that have to be tailored to your particular organization and best practices? That it does it deal with issues of child on child abuse, which is something we didn't even get into today? Is there effective training on those policies? Does it change year to year? Does it build on what the current best practices are? Has there been a public commitment to what it means to create safe spaces, just as this, this lecture and panel series that's taking place? And the truth is that these conversations are hard. They're hard, and it's important to acknowledge that they're hard. They are necessary, and they really make a difference. And when we think about what it means to actually create safe spaces in our communities, it means we prioritize the idea of saving a life and pikuach nefesh over any other issue. And that is what this is. And so I wanna thank you so much for inviting me into your community to talk for just a bit about what it means to cultivate safe spaces. And Ellen, I am turning it over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for this um, comprehensive and very detailed um, keynote. Um, we are now gonna enter the second component of this evening's program and it's our community panel. Our community panel is comprised of three highly regarded leaders of our community, um, Rabbi Andrew Rosenblatt, Rabbi Shlomo Gabay, and Ms. Shelley Rivkin. Rabbi Andrew Rosenblatt has been the spiritual leader since 2003 at Sherazetic Synagogue here in Vancouver. He sees his mission, dare I quote, as making Torah resonate with the experiences of modern life. 
and draws on his extensive academic and Torah education, as well as his creativity to put this vision into reality. Rabbi Rosenblatt, we are going to begin with you. Please proceed. <clears throat> thank you, Ellen, and uh, thank you, Rachel, for, uh, for that presentation. Um, Rachel not only speaks to the Vancouver Jewish community, she's also uh, um, been, uh, I guess, a, a consultant at large and has given a similar presentation to the Rabbinical Council of America and has really helped um, not just our corner of the world, but but um, I guess we would say the, the modern Orthodox leadership um, hopefully navigate new and safer paths in this, in this conversation. What I'd like to do is really, um, in a way, provide a little bit of the, the spiritual or the Torah underpinnings to um, the detail that Rachel gave us. And this is a, something which I think we are charged with in a, in a very direct manner. In, at the end of, now, well, yeah, towards the end of the book of Devarim, uh, in Parshat Kitetse, the Torah l lays out a whole uh, system of mitzvot. And in fact, the, mitz the mitzvot that are there are largely, if you catalog all of the mitzvot in Parshat Kitetse, many of them deal with protecting people or even creatures that are vulnerable. And when I say creatures, some of them deal with how you have to treat animals in a way which, which protects their own particular vulnerabilities. And one of the, <clears throat> the psukim there is the, it seems like a rather pedestrian verse. It almost like you might wonder why is the Torah in, introducing the housing code, the building code, into this list of spiritual mitzvot. And the pasuk reads, When you build a new house, you have to make a parapet, a, a fence for the roof. And then the argument, and this is a critical word here, is a critical phrase, Lotasim damim bevetecha. You shall not have blood guilt in your house. Because certainly it will bring someone to fall. When the Talmud comes to this particular uh, verse, it, it says this is not limited to making sure that your, your accessible roof has a good fence, but it includes two other categories, or I should say two other examples that, that come to open up an entire category. One is that you should not have a kelev ra, betoch beitecha, you shouldn't have an evil dog in your home. Let's leave the definition of what an evil dog is aside, but everyone agrees that that means a dog that is likely to bite someone who comes to visit you. The other example that the Talmud gives is sulam ra'ua, that you have a faulty ladder. That someone who's going to come to your house, go up to your loft, and climb the ladder will fall through one of the rungs that has rotted out. The, the principle that the Talmud lays down for us is that you have to create a safe space in your home. And that when you, you create a space that is likely to have dangers that can lurk within it, then you are yourself guilty. And it means that the structures are, are critically important, that the, the religious person has to look out for these structures because if you have bad structures, you are making the world ripe for an accident. And I think that's a, this applies equally well to, to situs, situations of abuse as it does to, to physical harm. The Torah gives us this general principle, and clearly the Talmud expands it. And I don't think we're meant to, to operate with such blinders that say, well, if the Torah didn't open up to, to broader categories, issues that can be interpersonal harm as opposed to, to physical tripping hazards, then, well, I'm absolved from my guilt. I think it's just the opposite. I think the Torah m means to give us a sense of direction, a sense of... of purpose that we are obligated to create a safe community. And sometimes that really takes a new level of expertise that is not necessarily coming out of the pages of the Talmud. Um, we had a, a group that came to us, I think in 2018 or so, that, that said one of the things that you have to be careful of as a synagogue is when you move from 
from services which have youth rooms and youth leaders and a supervised activity. Everybody goes into Kiddush, and then most synagogues in the world will leave their Kiddush rooms open. And God forbid, the groomers will say things like, you know, it's so hard to talk in the Kiddush room. Why don't we go up to the youth rooms or down to the youth rooms or wherever to the youth rooms so we can have some quiet time together? And that is what, what happens there is, God forbid, a thousand times, but saying God forbid isn't enough. That means that you have created an unsafe space because you have created a place where, where predators can operate with the perception of safety. A child thinks if I'm in the shul, I'm in the safe space. And you can't let that happen. And so that's something that, as part of our ongoing improvement, we have, have adopted that those spaces need to be locked. Sharat Tzedek, I'm sure Beit HaMidrash is doing the same, is engaged in an ongoing process of improving policy and procedure to make sure that, that we are creating, creating safer spaces. And I'm going to just put a pin in, in a question, if I could take the liberty of at least, I don't know if it's going to be the first question, but certainly a question I would like Rachel to address is there are, there are, there have been a number of calls since the Chaim Walder um, episode, or the revelations, I should say, that are suggesting that there should be a Jewish communal uh, court. You know, in Israel, there's the, uh, it was Rabbi Shmuel Eliyahu who convened a court to deal with these things, and I, and there are those who are concerned that that in the Jewish community there's no such parallel organization in within the religious community to to take hearings to to police or to otherwise manage potential complaints and I'm I'm curious as to uh, what um, Rachel thinks in terms of that as a structure um, and if if the um, and what other concrete recommendations she might offer for for Aside from, well, maybe we sh should all be um, hiring the Bayar Group to help do our, uh, our, uh, our, um, you know, our feasi our safety feasibility studies, but uh, maybe other concrete steps that we should be looking at in this in this capacity. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, we will now proceed to the second participant of our community panel. And that is Miss Shelley Rifkin. Um, a bit about Shelley. Shelley is a highly regarded uh, member of our community. Um, she has, throughout her years, been um, uh, greatly involved in developing social uh, policy. She is an adjunct professor at UBC and Langara School of Social Work. She has been working at um, the Jewish Federation of Greater Vancouver since 2007, I believe, and she at present is VP of Local and Global Engagement. Thank you, Ellen. Um, it's always a challenge to follow such dynamic and esteemed speakers as Rachel and Rabbi Rosenblatt. Um, so, uh, for, so I want to start by thanking Sherat Zedek and Beta Midrash uh, for organizing this event. It's so important that as a community, we break the silence ar around issues such as this. I first began my career in child abuse prevention in 1986 at a time when uh, public awareness was very low and a skepticism about the existence of child sexual abuse was very high. And there were a lot of the stereotypes that Rachel talks about, the stranger danger, the creepy person, and that we, we had to spend tremendous amount of time to dispel those myths, but also more importantly, to convince people that this was not a private matter. This was a responsibility. This was an issue that had to be in the public domain. And I think over the years, both the child welfare and the criminal justice system have made significant improvements. But unless we as community, we as families, as parents, relatives understand that these issues have to be out in the open, we are still going to be dealing with the staggering statistics. So I want to provide a little bit of a Canadian lens. Um, so in Canada, we believe that sexual abuse affects one in four girls and one in six boys. And it took a long time for people to get over 
the, the idea that boys could be equally vulnerable than girls. And it is often much more challenging for boys to disclose or talk about what has happened to them because of the stigma and the shame that boys experience. What we do know is the girls are more likely to be sexually abused in the home or with someone close, a family member, an acquaintance, somebody who often is in the family context. And the family inadvertently supports and, condone, and, con, and allows the relationship to develop. Boys are more likely to be sexually abused in the community by someone they hold in high regard. Uh, it could be a hockey coach. It could be uh, someone else in, on a sports team. It could be a favorite teacher or in the Jewish world. It could be a Torah teacher or a yeshiva teacher. So often the context in which the abuse happens is very important to understand. The levels of secrecy in the family are so much greater and the opportunity for people to see what is happening is so much greater. And the, is, that is why it is so important for children to not only have the tools, but be encouraged to trust their feelings. And often children have a sense that something's icky, something's uncomfortable, something is confusing to them. But because this person is held in high regard, because this person is someone in the family that is respected, that is loved, they don't feel confident to act on these feelings that they have, or they make tentative efforts to disclose. They make tentative efforts to, to say certain things, and they watch very carefully the adult reaction. When they say something like, I'm uncomfortable with Mr. So-and-so, or I don't want to see Rabbi this, and the parent says, I don't understand why, or you love him, or he's such a wonderful person, that effort to disclose is shut down. We also know that it is not the physical damage, and it's rarely the physical damage that creates the long-term harm. It is the emotional abuse. It is the secrecy, the silence. And then, the, um, Rachel, you talked about the very positive, or not positive, but the pleasant aspects of grooming. But over time, especially as children get older, there are threats, there are statements that if you don't continue to do this, I'm going to hear hurt a younger sibling. If you don't, if you don't go along with me, this is going to happen to you. So the grooming starts out in a way that the child feels appreciated. They feel, um, they feel that somebody understands them. But over time, that dynamic changes. And often that's the time when they make the attempt to disclose and how important it is for us to be sensitive to those words. A colleague of mine once said that people who have sexually abused children are the most skilled psychologists. They understand, they can pick up, as Rachel said, those vibes the child who's needy, the child that's lonely, but they also have a way of communicating where they can connect with the child and that they have skills that often many of us don't have. So as parents and family members, as we need to have, children need to be taught about appropriate and in, inappropriate boundaries. They may, need to be encouraged to trust their feelings. If something doesn't feel good, it probably isn't something they should be doing. They need to have the language to describe what is happening to them. And as Rachel so eloquently described, children need to understand the differences between secrets and surprises. And they need to understand that a surprise is something you can tell and it's not gonna hurt somebody. But a secret, you're often told you can never tell and it can hurt people. Uh, it is appropriate that children be taught to respect youth and uh, adults. And in our community, we, have, we hold a lot of reverence to people who have scholarship, people who have positions of authority, people who are in positions of trust. However, they need to know that if an older person or adult asks them to do things or watch things or touch things, and that is a secret, that they will not be punished, that they will be listened to, and that they will be validated. 
as organizations, we have a lot of things we can do to create safe spaces. First and foremost, organizations need to be proactive in having clear and transparent policies regarding the expected paper, behavior of all who interact with youth. It's not enough to have some kind of ominous policy. It needs to be specific and detailed. What is expected? All organizations need to have a, a policy for criminal records checks. This is a mandatory requirement for people working with children and vulnerable adults. Whether it's the school janitor or the security guard or a volunteer or a high school student who's working in the NCSY chapter or the paid professional, they all need to have criminal record checks and the criminal record checks for working with vulnerable children. And in fact, the provincial government pays for not-for-profit not organizations to have these criminal record checks done. So the cost should not be a barrier. We need to have adequate training. All employees and volunteers working with children and youth should have training, not only to understand what is appropriate behavior for them and how they interact with children, but for them to be aware of the signs and indicators. Because often a trusted adult or youth worker or even a volunteer can have a very strong relationship, a very appropriate and healthy relationship with a child or youth. And they may be the one that is going to be receiving the disclosure. They need to understand how to respond appropriately because so often children and youth, if they don't get the immediate response that they want, they will retract. They will deny that what they started to say is true because they fear the consequences. Organizations need to have a clear and transparent reporting policy. In British Columbia, we have a requirement that we are all obligated to report. We can report by formally phoning and making a, um, making a complaint to what is the child abuse, what's informally known as the child abuse line. Or if we don't want to report and have our name associated with the report, we can report anonymously. We're not required to provide a lot of information. We are just required to provide some very basic details. If, you, if an organization is concerned that they have somebody on staff or they have somebody who is a volunteer who may have uh, sexually, sexually abused, sexually touched, or sexually interfered with a child, you can report directly to the police. The police will take that responsibility of doing the of, of following up on the information. Children and youth should never be made to feel responsible for the behavior of adults, and they should not be required to ensure the safety of themselves. Thank you. And you're muted. So we maybe put it in the chat after Rabbi Gabai. Um, Shelley Rabbi is going to be putting up um, this the four slides. I I just wanted to add that we really have been gifted this evening with the coming together of each of you with your expertise. Um, focusing on the social and emotional well-being of our most vulnerable. Um, Shelley, if you want to um, add anything to what is now up on the screen. So I, I just um, highlighted three or four key points that I had made, and I think probably the most important thing we want to leave people with um, is the um, numbers that they can call if they have any concern. So this, this is the provincial centralized screening team. They can either call one of these two numbers. And again, I just really want to say um, it is more important that you act on a suspicion than uh, repress that action. We, we always can um, back off a, a report, but we can't protect, we can't leave out protecting a child. Okay. <laughs> 
And now for the third participant of our community panel, um, I'd like to ask Rabbi Shlomo Gabay to join us. Um, Rabbi Shlomo Gabay is the spiritual leader of Beit Hamidra Synagogue, Canada's only Sephardic synagogue west of Toronto. In 2019, Rabbi Gabay was inducted as the rabbi of our synagogue by the chief rabbi of the Commonwealth, Rabbi Ephraim Mervis. Rabbi Gabay. Thank you, Ellen. Um, if what Shelly just said about speaking after esteemed speakers, I feel humbled to be on a panel with such um, incredible presenters and colleagues of such high caliber. Um, I really want to say to Rachel, thank you. You know, the passion in which you speak about this topic, the articulation, the way you speak is no surprise that you are such a thought after speaker. And we really want to thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I just want to really touch upon a topic which may be, you know, being such a diverse topic and such a broad topic, it's kind of difficult to pack everything into the hour or so that we have. And I want to touch upon something related but not, which hasn't directly been spoken about. Rabbi Rosenblatt eloquently described the importance of having safe spaces and creating those safe spaces from a Torah perspective. And I just want to share a little bit of a different perspective with regards to reporting abuse when um, somebody is made aware of something, you know, when boundaries have been crossed, any awareness, as Rachel mentioned, not the creepy guy, but we really want to talk about being made aware of something that's happened. Um, Shelley also mentioned the appropriate procedure and how the relevant uh, authorities to report. I just want to kind of bring a little bit of a Torah perspective on that. So I'm just going to share my screen. So first of all, what does the Torah say about sexual abuse? Does the Torah talk about it? What is the perspective of the extent of the damage of the abuse? There is a fascinating insight with three words the Torah gives in Sefer Devarim, the very end of the Torah and Parshat Kitete. And the Pasuk Devarim 22-26 says the following. The context of the Pasuk is about rape. And the Pasuk says as follows. Kika asher yakum ish al For when a person comes to attack another, ul nefesh and murders them, says the Pasuk three words, ken hadavar hazeh, so too is this act. When we talk about rape, when we talk about sexual abuse, it's tantamount to murder. I think those three words are so telling into the extent of the damage where people are at, someone who's experienced sexual abuse tantamount to murders. You know, it's not just about the act, the long-term effects, it's just unbelievable. But there is a common myth, which I kind of want to address, which people talk about, well, I'm not sure, I'm not convinced, we don't have proof, it's Lashon Hara. And I want to kind of bring a bit of a context to this concept. The Pasuk, one of the many psukim in the Torah, which talks about Lashon Hara, is Lo Telech Rachil Be'amecha, which tells us, basically, don't speak Lashon Hara, don't speak evil gossip. The interesting part is that the end of the Pasuk says, Lo Ta'amod Al Dam Re'echa Ani Hashem. Do not stand by idly when you see your brother's blood being spilled. And the Orachayim HaKadosh, the Holy Orachayim in the 17th century, says something unbelievable. He says, if you think that Lashon Hara is supposed to not be spoken, and you will chas v'shalom, not say something when you are aware that something has, been happen that has happened, says Arachayim, do not forget how the Pasuk ends. Lo ta'amod al dam re'echa. Make sure that Lashon Hara won't come 
and damage what's going to happen if you don't give that information. What will happen to the victim if you don't speak out? And the Rahim finishes off with a famous Gemara, a piece in the Talmud in Nida, which says a story about Gedalia ben Achika. We all know one of the fasts which we mention, or which we fast related to the uh, destruction of the temple, is a fast about Gedalia ben Achika, one of the governors who was appointed by Nebuchadnezzar at the end of the first temple, after the destruction of the first temple. And Gedalia was told about an assassination attempt to his very life. And Gedalia does not heed. In fact, the Gemara says, he was concerned about the malicious speech about the Lashon Hara. So he decided not to heed those warnings. And as a result, he was assassinated. Actually happened on Rosh Hashanah, at his Rosh Hashanah table. We don't fast on Rosh Hashanah, we fast the next day. But this is, just a bit of an understanding where things can go if we know information and we don't take it seriously. I want to finish off with such a powerful Kitre Tshuva, which I heard from my rabbi, Rabbi Zimmerman in London, when he was addressing specifically sexual abuse. I think this Kitre Tshuva was written by Rabbi Avram Tzvi Hirsch Eisenstadt from Bialystok, Poland, lived in between 1812 and 1868. He says something so powerful that I think wraps up this whole discussion. And I'll read it out to you. I see it necessary to state something here. on the matter shall call Musar here Haolam. All the books of Musar, all the ethical books, turned over the world about the sin of Roshan Hara. Says Rat the Pitre Chuva. Va'ani mar'ish ha'olam lehefech. And I shout out to the contrary. Al avon gadol mizeh. On a sin far greater than Lashon Hara. V'gam hu matsu yoter. And more prevalent. V'hu, and that is, miniat atzmo miledaber b'makom ha'nitrach. A person who refrains from talking out in a place when it's necessary. To prevent a victim from being harmed by the perpetrator. If we are aware of a boundary that was crossed inappropriately, of sexual misconduct, whatever that looks like, we have a Torah obligation of lo ta'amod al damre'acha, which pushes away any other concept of Lashon Hara, of any such thing. Rebel Yashev, one of the greatest. Uh, Poskim in this century, and many of the great senior rabbis in Eretz Israel have all stated very clearly, one has a Torah obligation to not stand idly. Lo tamod adam recha. Thank you, Rabbi Gabai. Thank you to the panel for providing their insights and their contributions to this evening's program. And of course, to you, Rachel Bayer, for all that you have brought to us here to our community. Uh, we will now um, merge into the third component of this evening's program. And that is an opportunity for anyone wishing to pose a question. I have some that have been sent um, to me directly, which I will share with you. Um, but anybody interested, please feel free to put in right into the chat and um, we will address them accordingly. Um, Rabbi Rosenblatt, you did pose a question in your presentation and I do want to ensure that we have an opportunity to um, give Rachel an opportunity to speak to that. And again, um, Rabbi, you probably will be able to pose it in a more succinct manner than myself. But again, it refers to um, the need. Is there a need for some sort of internal structure or body or co court, um, rabbinical as such? Um, what are your thoughts on that? You got the question right. I think Rachel oh. can take it from there. So, you know, 
My my succinct answer to that is it's a terrible idea um, for a variety of reasons. But let me kind of backtrack and pose a question back for anybody that's thinking to themselves, well, maybe it is a good idea. Maybe we should have some sort of baked in or internal you know, uh, assessment of whether sexual abuse is really happening. And I want to ask the question back, would we consider that for an alleged homicide? Would we consider that for an alleged burglary? Would we consider that for any other type of crime? So what is it about sexual abuse? What is it about abuse of children that makes us think as though we would ever be better equipped than the trained forensic interviewers, than the police or law enforcement, that we would ever be better suited to vet something when we will be more connected to it than the authorities who are legally mandated to do it. And by the way, not to mention, it would be against the law, right? When you think about what it means to actually report and the fact that it is mandated, it's not mandated so that this can live in the cloud of mandating reports. It's so that there can be a process to not only seek justice, but ensure that people are protected. We are not in a position, and I say we as the Jewish community, as any faith-based community, to decide that when it comes to child abuse or child sexual abuse, that we could better vet it, understand it, navigate through it. We have no power of, you know, here in the United States, we call it the subpoena power. I'm assuming that you have something similar as well. But in other words, we have no ability to decide that, first of all, we have no ability to gain that information. But even if we did, what do you do with it once you have it? What happens if you determine that in a case like a Chaim Walder situation, for those of you that are not familiar with it, um, it has really kind of exploded within uh, the Jewish community across the world. Um, but when you think about it, and, and I won't go into the details now, but you can Google it and there's a lot out there. When you think about the Chaim Walder situation and what at the end of that Beitin, if he had not killed himself, what would the situation have been? Did they have the ability to arrest him? Did they have the ability to prosecute him, to ensure that he would never ever do anything to another child? No. So just because we are nervous or scared, and I say the collective we, because this is something that feels like, hmm, we don't wanna, you know, on some level people say to themselves, but if we report it, we're airing our dirty laundry. This is dirty laundry that has to be aired. It's the only way to actually keep people safe. And aside from the fact that it would be against the law, aside from the fact that it's not for us to decide when we are connected to something, the bottom line is by doing that, we re-traumatize every single child and every single adult who in order for justice to be served then has to actually speak to law enforcement. And so all of that is to say, I think it's a terrible idea. Um, and I would never be in favor of that. Ellen, I think you may be muted still. I'm going to pose another um, question. Rachel, this is to you. Um, how is a situation like this moved from what we call or what was referred to this evening as the private domain from the private domain to the public domain? Because right now it's referred to as something done behind the doors. Um, but in terms of our response to it, how can we move it from the private domain uh, to the public domain? So I would ask for a clarification on that question. I'm not completely sure about the parameters of what's being asked. Um, I'm wondering if the person that put that question in could clarify that just a bit. As it could refer to lots of things. So I wanna make sure that I'm answering the actual question that's being asked. Um, I'm gonna take a liberty here. Sure. Uh, and um, I think the, the assumption here is that it is, for the most part, dealt, pro dealt with privately. What sort of next steps does one take so that we are dealing with it on a larger, more structured, right. larger, more structured manner? Kind of what is the action plan? I think the action plan is both in recognizing everything, and I want to lift up everything that Shelley said, 
with regard to the legal obligation to report. What does it mean to report? What does it mean to make that report to law enforcement, right? What does it mean to understand that it is not for us to deal with this privately? That there is not a situation that I've ever heard of. And I, when I was a prosecutor, I, pro I, I probably prosecuted, you know, probably over a thousand, if not more, but definitely hundreds of cases. Um, when I conducted historical abuse investigations, I, I can't even identify how many I've done. I've never seen a situation where somebody handling child sexual abuse privately has ever yielded anything but a re-traumatization and in addition to that, not succeeded in protecting children. The bottom line is we report because, not just because it's legally required, but because it is the right thing to do because there are people who are trained to protect children that are trained to conduct these interviews. And as somebody that was a forensic interviewer for many years and sat with children starting from the age of, of two or three up until adults that were you know, in their 90s, navigating the complexities of what it means to talk to someone about this, um, that's what we do. We follow the law and we recognize that we should not be ashamed to follow the law and we should never be ashamed to protect our community. I liken this, and I'm just gonna add this piece on, people get very nervous about implementing protocols and policies and training. They get very nervous about what it means to acknowledge something head on. And I always liken it to what would you do if you had a child with allergies to peanuts, right? What would you do? Right, if you had a child that was allergic to peanuts, would you ever hesitate for a moment to ask a school or to ask a camp or to ask a play date, hey, my child has an allergy, so therefore, what do you do? Is my child safe where you are? Is your synagogue not free? Can you share with me the protocols to ensure that something will not harm my child? We, and I, I once actually, I actually asked a friend of mine whose child has severe allergies to food, have you ever been embarrassed to ask that question? And her response was, and I've never been embarrassed. Why would I ever be embarrassed? This is a matter of life and death. If we shift our perspective to the fact that this is a matter of life and death, then the issue of moving from private to public, of asking those questions, of engaging in really creating safe spaces will never be something that we would ever consider being private again, because we'll realize the enormity of what it is we are doing. You may still be on mute. Uh... Next, I'd like to share another question. Um, how do we educate our, our children um, that otherwise are taught to totally respect um, adults? How do you go about teaching them? What, what, are, what is the one, two, three steps? So that in and of itself is probably going to be longer than a 30 second response. I see Shelly nodding. She and I both recognize that that in and of itself could be a two hour training, very much so. Um, but I think that what it really starts with is an understanding that abuse prevention is not about a big sit down conversation. It's about small moments. And what that means is that from the time our children are very little, we approach different safety situations in terms of small, I call them ripple effects. Effects, the ripple effects, the small moments. When I was teaching any of my children to cross the street, we would walk to shul, we would walk to synagogue on Shabbat, and we would get to the end of the street and I would pause and I would say, I want you to look both ways, I want you to listen, do you see a car, do you hear a car? And I never turned to them and said, if you don't do this, you're going to cross the street and get hit by a car and your guts are going to be spilled out all on the inside, all on the street. I never went into graphic detail with them. But it was very clear from both my tone and the fact that we did this every single Shabbat at a moment when we were standing by the street and it was an opportunity for a teachable moment that this was of value and that this was important and that this was important. And I really believe that abuse prevention starts at a very young age, but it's never too late to have these small moments. And from the time your children are very little, it's about 
multiple components, teaching them the correct anatomical names for their body parts, making sure that there's no shame or embarrassment attached to the fact that kids have specific genitals. They have names. And those names are actually just as important as their nose and their ears and their eyes. And when we attach shame or embarrassment or nicknames to their genitals, what we are teaching them is that there's something to be embarrassed about, which means that if God forbid something does happen, they will be less likely to ever mention anything because they're thinking, but this is a shameful part. I'm embarrassed. I'm not supposed to do anything with this, which means I caused this. Not to mention the fact that it becomes impossible as somebody that was former law enforcement to prosecute a case when a child is calling their genitals by a nickname, right? Or, or something like a cookie, right? Or something that has nothing to do with that part of their body. When we think about children being really little, it's not just about implementing the correct name for their body parts. It's about starting to categorize behaviors as safe versus unsafe, right? Thinking about what I call, or what, not just me, this is not original to me, green flag feelings and red flag feelings. The idea that when you go to the beach and you see a red flag, what does it mean? It means danger, right? The water is not safe, but a green flag means it's safe, you're good to go in. So what are green flag feelings versus red flag feelings? If you have a child that's about to touch the stove, well, that's a red flag feeling, right? It's about categorizing behaviors in terms of things that are safe and unsafe. And I think that the last component, and again, this in and of itself could be two hours. The last component that I think is really important is to talk about tricky behaviors. It's not about what someone looks like. It's not about the way, you know, you know, what color hair they have or their skin color or their eye color. It's about their behaviors. You talk about secrets versus surprises. A safe person will never ask you to keep a secret from your parents. A safe person will never ask you to go somewhere alone without letting your parent know. By the way, even if it's someone in your family, right? A safe person will never tell you that if you tell your parents something, that something bad will happen to a sibling or a parent. A safe parent, a safe person will never turn to your child and say, no one will believe you if you come forward. And really starting to implement these moments. I'll just tell you kind of a, a memory that's seared for me is one of the first kind of small conversations that I was having with one of my children when they were really young. They're now in high school, so this is a long time ago. Um, I was folding laundry. And I remember um, something must have been said, and I just kind of per I just, you know, kind of poked my head up and I turned to my daughter and I said, a different daughter, by the way, and I turned to her and I said, um, hey, by the way, you know that if anybody ever tries to touch your private parts, and I actually use the anatomical correct name, I said, if anybody ever tries to touch your vulva or vagina, and she immediately like stopped and she like looked at me and she was like, oh my gosh, that's gross. Why would anybody ever do that? And in that moment, I remember being really scared. What am I supposed to say? Am I supposed to go into a detailed analysis of pedophilia and sexual abuse? Like my kid is under the age of five. What am I supposed to do? And I remember thinking in my head, take a deep breath and answer the question. And I did, I took a deep breath. I relaxed my shoulders. I looked her in the eye and I said this. I said, you know, most people in this world are totally awesome. They're actually amazing. But sometimes there are unsafe people or people who do unsafe things. And just like if you saw someone jumping into a pool and there was no lifeguard there and that's super unsafe, or if you saw someone playing with knives and that's super unsafe, this would also mean that this is an unsafe person. And with unsafe people, I want you to know that you should come and tell me. And the truth is that you may be scared to tell me, but I want you to know I'll always believe you. And no matter what, nothing was ever your fault. And being able to integrate that into a conversation where you're folding laundry or washing the dishes is really how you build effective abuse prevention. Incremental. Um, what you have just shared with us, Rachel, is actually head on um, what the next question um, focuses on. How do you approach the conversation of sexual abuse 
to young boys aged nine to 12. Is it better for a father or a mother to approach boys? Do you have to go into details of different scenarios of cases of abuse in having that conversation? And I would invite Shelly also, if there's anything obviously that you wanna to add to this, um, to join yes. in. Yes. I, I really believe that every family has to decide how it works for them. I could tell you that there's a one size fits all approach and that either parent, no matter who they are, should feel comfortable having these conversations. And I truly believe that, you know, I may be a former sex crimes prosecutor, but I have made my husband absolutely learn the terminology and the language and have these conversations without me present because it's not about being a professional, it's about being a parent. And this is an aspect of parenting. That being said, every family is different and you have to decide who in your family, whether this is something that you're both comfortable with, whether you are a parent that has even had the option, if you have a partner or a spouse to be able to join in this with, maybe you don't have that option. I don't think that there's a right or a wrong parent to have this discussion. I do believe that children need to know that their parents are safe people to be able to come to and I do think it's important that it's not just be gendered. Oh, it's a father talking to a son, or oh, it's a mother talking to a daughter. Because what happens if the child is not comfortable talking to one parent or another? And so I really see this as something that goes beyond the gender lines. I also think that when it comes to kids, let's say a nine-year-old, a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, if you've never had these conversations before, I actually think that using a panel like this, I tell people all the time, you can blame me, like the scary redheaded lady that spoke to you, right? When I'm in a school or when I'm in a camp or things of that sort, you know, books are a really wonderful option. There are some great books out there saying to your child, you know, I just heard this speech about something that we've never talked about before but I actually think it's really important. And I'm sorry that we've never talked about it before. I'd love to talk about Rachel, it now. Um, you're absolutely right. It could be, we could easily four hours and, and still not do um, it justice. There are another couple of questions I'd like to put on the table. Um, this question is for Rachel. A feature of abuse in religious communities has been abusers that get shuffled between institutions rather than dealt with directly. What, st what steps can, be in can institutions take when vetting a new hire or volunteer to ensure they are being told about any history of abuse or concerns from previous employers, even ones who are reluctant to report? So Rachel, if you can share, um, respond to this, and then I'd also like to defer to um, Shelley as well. And Shelly, you know, what I would say is I'm not going to speak about the legal implications of what is allowed or not allowed um, in Canada. So I think that that's an important piece of this um, for anybody that doesn't realize I'm actually uh, situated in the United States. And so I want to be very mindful and clear about those boundaries. Um, I think that the way that this changes is if we change this. Right. I think that when we think about reference checking, you know, historically, what we think about that is a if it's ever done. You know, an individual gives two or three names, you call the two or three names, they're never going to say anything bad because those are the people that the person picked. So are you looking at a resume? Are you looking at gaps in the resume? Have, has this person taught in five schools in, in a matter of four years? Or have they gone to five different camps and never actually stayed in the same one? And then what questions are you asking? So are you calling people that aren't being given as references and saying, so what can you share with me about why this person doesn't work here anymore? And if the person says something like, there isn't much I can share, well, you may want to read between the lines, or I can't disclose anything. That is not a glowing endorsement, mm -hmm. right? So when you think about reading between the lines, that's a big piece of this. Thank you, Rachel. Shelley, um, would you like to add anything? Sure, I just want to quickly say two things. One is I think this is a perfect reason why it's so important to report because so often you're right, people have been transferred with, and so there's absolutely no record or no history. The other thing is when you're doing criminal record checks, just because we live in, for most of us, we live in a Vancouver Police Department jurisdiction. If you notice that someone has had a pattern of moving, 
then you can do a higher level criminal record check through the RCMP. But the key thing is if we don't report, there's no record. Thank you. Um, I definitely want to take this next question. Um, so this would be directed to Rabbi Rosenblatt and Rabbi Gabai. Are there particular ways in which child abuse victims within an observant Jewish community are treated post abuse? Are there approaches which are uniquely Jewish? Rabbi Rosenblatt? I have to um, speak very candidly. Um, I have not had to uh, deal directly with this, and I I have no basis of comparison for for how it would be dealt with in a Jewish community versus another community. I would simply say that I would hope and expect that it's dealt with, um, on the one hand, with real seriousness in terms of, of the potential harms in the community and the, the potential for 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 um, the harm that could happen, you know, in a serial fashion so that, that it's taken very seriously. And then in terms of the victim, I hope that it would be dealt with with extreme compassion and that the uh, the identity of the victim and the, the privacy of the victim um, and the you know, the, the emotional welfare would be dealt with um, in the most um, compassionate way possible. But again, I, I have to say that, you know, I can't speak from experience on this. Rabbi Gabai? Yes, so I'm, I'm gonna go with Rabbi Rosenblatt on this one. I think, you know, one of the um, most important things that we can do, as Rachel mentioned at the beginning, is raising awareness. I can tell you, me, myself, um, the amount of uh, knowledge and information that just, you know, helping putting this thing together is, is just simply mind-blowing. So, you know, lucky for us, Rachel is a religious Jewish woman, and I think she is uniquely um, placed to be able to talk to this. I, I think I want to defer to her on this one. Okay. I mean, yeah, go ahead. Ellen, were you No, Rachel, please, please continue. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I think that part of the problem is that there hasn't been enough education um, and that there is a stigma that still attaches to children and to adults, and there is a fear of stigma. And I think that part of what we have seen over the coming, over the course of just even the past few months and the past few years is this acknowledgement that this very much can't be a stigma anymore, right? We would never turn to someone who is the victim of a robbery or a burglary, or let's use the equivalent of, of a robbery. We would never turn to someone who's walking down the street with a cell phone and you know someone comes up to them and puts a gun to their head and says, give me your phone. We would never expect to ask them questions. Well, were you holding your phone too high? Did you have a sparkly case? Were you talking too loudly? Did you seem as though the phone was so heavy that you needed help carrying it so someone came and stole it? Right? We have never put the blame or the onus on any victim of any other crime. But for some reason, when it comes to sex crimes, especially when it comes to both children and adults, we have this initial tendency to not want to believe the person that's coming forward. What I believe is that not what we have seen, but I am looking future into the future to say, what should we be seeing? And I want to see from a Jewish, Jewish perspective, I no longer want to hear that we don't speak about things because of Lashon Hara. I no longer want to hear that we don't air our dirty laundry or that we don't report for any reason. What I want to see is what I've seen over the past few months, people who have loud voices within our Jewish community and the worldwide Jewish community saying, it's time to put a stop to this. This is never going to be a survivor or a victim's fault. So I hope that that answers it kind of sufficiently. Thank you. Uh, Rabbi Gabai, do we have time for one more question? I think the last question. Okay, so this will be the last. Um, and Shelly, I'm going to direct it to you. Um, if you will, how to deal with a situation in a child where a traumatic event brings to surface 
a sexual misadventure that had been repressed? Um, so let me start by saying what we're talking about is not a sexual misadventure. We're talking about some form of sexual abuse or sexual exploitation uh, by a person in a position of trust. So I think that it's the same as how we would handle any other disclosure. We're going to respond calmly. We're going to listen. We're not going to put words in a person's mouth. We're going to be very honest about what we can and cannot do. We must never promise things that we can't deliver on. Um, uh, we need to understand. So if it's a situation where the parent is hearing um, the disclosure, the parent needs to make a decision how they're going to report. Um, if it's a professional or a volunteer, they need to follow appropriate protocols. I, I think that in every situation, uh, we have an obligation to take that sense of raw responsibility off the child's shoulders and put it back into the system. Um, so that so whatever the circumstances are, what we've heard is a disclosure. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for joining us this evening and for being part of community for it takes the collective commitment and efforts of all of us in protecting, sustaining and growing community and in creating safe spaces. Thank you to all, to the panel, to Rachel, all who have partaken and contributed their wisdom, expertise and knowledge. All of your participation, all of you in the audience who have partaken um, this is testimony to what is often said that it takes a village to grow a child. Well, it's that same village that we need in protecting that same community in protecting, sustaining and growing our own community, creating safe spaces. Thank you to our esteemed keynote speaker, Rachel, to our community leaders and to all of you for joining us this evening. Good night to everybody.